And now for the main course. After two years of dormancy due to the global pandemic, community cultural festivals are beginning to spring back to life this season. Recently, we had the opportunity to speak with leaders of the three largest Japanese cultural festivals in Northern California about the challenges of organizing a festival during a pandemic and what to expect at their festivals this spring. The following are interviews we had of Kiyomi Takeda of the Northern California Cherry Blossom Festival in San Francisco's Japantown, Doug Ray of the Nikkei Matsuri in San Jose's Japantown, and Alisa Sakis of the Cupertino Cherry Blossom Festival. They all stopped by to chat at the cafe about what lies ahead as their festivals spring forward. This year marks the 55th annual Northern California Cherry Blossom Festival, the largest Japanese spring festival in Northern California. It also marks the first in-person festival since 2019, as the festival was forced to go virtual the past two years. But just as sure as the cherry blossoms bloom, so too does the Northern California Cherry Blossom Festival, which will re-emerge this April 9th, 10th, 16th, and 17th. Today we have former Cherry Blossom Festival co-chair Kiyomi Takeda, who sits on the board of mm -hmm. Sakura Matsuri Incorporated, the fiscal sponsor of the festival. Hello Kiyomi, and thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to the Nichi Bay Cafe. Thanks Ryan, thanks for having me. You were the co-chair of the festival in 2020, the year where the pandemic virtually shut down the city. How difficult was it to suddenly stop such a large event with just days to go? To say that we were disappointed would be an understatement. My co-chair Greg and I uh, worked really hard, not only on the festival planning, but also working with the city to figure out what it is we were dealing with. So we were just so grateful to our committee who was still working at it, working so hard, despite knowing that there was a very high chance that we would be canceling at any moment. We did decide to close the festival or shut down the festival before we were told to do so. My heart did go out to our vendors, our nonprofit formation booths, uh, the food booth, as well as our San Francisco J-Town small businesses. And we knew that it was our responsibility to really think about their their health and sustainability moving forward as we go enter the pandemic. It was definitely a, a very, very challenging. This year, you have two new co-chairs uh, representing younger multiracial generations. Can you tell us a little more about co-chairs Matt Nagatomi and Quillen Rusky? Matt and Quillen may seem young on the outside, but they are so wise beyond, beyond their years. And they know this festival inside and out. They are the breath of the festival. The amount of energy that those two um, and the executive secretary, Yuki Nishimura, bring to this festival this year is just amazing. In addition to their logistical experience, like they have such community knowledge and experience. So lastly, uh, how will this year's Cherry Blossom Festival be different? And what can visitors expect from this year's event? This is our first in person after two years, and we can't forget that we are in a pandemic. So for those reasons, unfortunately, we made the hard decision of not having the Grand Parade this year. In addition to that, we have minimized our footprint and unfortunately are not going to be in the Japanese Cultural Community Center, which has housed us for many years. We will continue to have our nonprofit food booths, our information booths, our sponsor booths, as well as our arts and craft vendors, as well as our main stage, the Peace Plaza stage this year, housing all of our cultural performances. We'll have a virtual component, so please stay tuned for our second weekend and check our website for information there. So for all of you that haven't attended the Cherry Blossom Festival April 9 and 10, please feel free to join us at the Cherry Blossom Festival again on April 16th and 17th. Thank you, Kiyomi, for joining us at the Nichibe Cafe and good luck in organizing. Thank you so much for having me. Since 1978, the Nikkei Matsuri or festival has showcased the contributions and cultural achievements of the Japanese American community. The origin of the festival began with the city of San Jose's 1977 bicentennial celebration, Issei Legacy, which was an event that coordinated over 30 Japanese American cultural groups and associations. This network of organizations and volunteers established the framework for Nikkei Matsuri festivals to come. Emerging out of two years of the pandemic, Nikkei Matsuri will once again rise in the streets of San Jose's Japantown on Sunday, April 24th. Today, we are happy to have with us Doug Ray, the president of the Nikkei Matsuri Foundation. Hello, Doug. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and uh, welcome to the Nichibei Cafe. Thanks for having me. 
How long have you been involved with Enrique Matsudi and how did your involvement evolve over the years? Well, I first got involved with the Nikkei Matsuri organization at that point as the president of the Japantown Lions Club. We were just forming in 2011, actually a month after the Toku earthquake and tsunami, and we were looking for a way to do fundraising, and lo and behold, Nikkei Matsuri had an open spot in the ever-famous food booth. So I was the food chair uh, representing the Lions to the Nikkei Matsuri organization. I did that for several years until somebody on the board asked me if I would like to be <laughs> more involved. And then in 2019, I was elected as, I guess you'd call an upcoming president or president in training. As you re-emerged with an in-person festival, what have been the challenges of organizing a festival in the post-pandemic era? Of course, we're doing everything we can to follow county and state guidelines and now city guidelines with regard to masking and social distancing and all the kinds of things that that come along with that. Honestly, other than the fact that we were a little rusty as a board, I think the challenges really have been to balance trying to bring more youth and pop culture into the festival while maintaining the cultural and traditional facets of the Matsuri. How will this year's festival have a different look and feel than previous years? So we will still have a community and uh, local organizations. We will still have a main stage with traditional performances. We will still have Ikebana and Bonsai inside of the Buddhist church. Uh, there will be a judo performance, uh, a kodo performance in there. We'll have, uh, we'll require masks for any indoor performances. Outdoors on Jackson Street, which is, is the street where all the artisans line up, and we have just short of 70 artisans this year. We'll have an organization called San Jose Boombox who have provided audiovisual uh, sound equipment for events like Calle San Jose. We're going to have five live Japanese themed bands. These are pop culture type bands that are going to be performing during the day with a live DJ in between sets. And then this year uh, we're also adding Japanese customized car group. Finally, food court is probably the, the mainstay of the Matsuri. And this year we've added four food trucks who will be serving Japanese themed and Hawaiian themed uh, offerings as well. We're going to also offer beer and sake this year. We want to have something for the youth that come to be involved or stay involved, as well as for the people that have always frequented the, the Matsuri in years past. Thank you, Doug, for joining us at the Nichi Bay Cafe. Thanks for having me. This is great. We really look forward to the festival and hopefully you can join us. And for all of you watching, for more information on this year's Nikkei Matsuri, visit NikkeiMatsuri.org. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. After two years of the pandemic, the Cupertino Cherry Blossom Festival will reemerge Saturday, April 30th and Sunday, May 1st in the city's Memorial Park. Today, we are happy to have with us Elisa Sakas, a longtime organizer of the festival. Hello, Elisa. Uh, thanks so much for joining us and welcome to the Nichibay Cafe. Thanks for having me. How long have you been involved with the Cupertino Cherry Blossom Festival? Uh, my son was selected as a student exchange delegate in 2007, and that's when I became involved with the nonprofit Cupertino Toyokawa Sister Cities that organizes this festival, as well as other activities in our city that are related to the sister city relationship. It's become a beloved community event where we take time to honor our sister city, Toyokawa, Japan, by sharing Japanese culture with the community. And it's the only two day event held in our city. The world came to a standstill just as planning for the 2020 festival was underway. How difficult was it to suddenly stop such a large event with just weeks to go? We were absolutely heartbroken to have to call our festival off because we were in full swing planning when the pandemic shutdown occurred. But in 2021 came along and we conducted a virtual festival that we were able to feature just a few of our performers that we typically have. And you can still watch this virtual festival on our YouTube channel, Cupertino Toyokawa Sister Cities, California. What have been the challenges of organizing a festival in the post-pandemic era? Well, fortunately, after so many years conducting this festival, our cast of some 40 committee members really runs like a pretty well-oiled machine. So for the most part, we just picked up where we left off. But 
it hasn't been without its glitches. And so there were plenty of small tweaks that we had to make for, for the festival. And also probably our biggest change, our biggest challenge is that we had to cancel our student exchange program this year. So we didn't have the student delegates and their families to participate. And they've always been such an important and large number of our volunteers each year. Uh, will there be anything different from past festivals this year? Every year we have something new at our festival and it's really one of the features that I think makes our festival so vibrant and keeps festival goers coming back each year. Each year we have new performers so check out our program to see both the returning favorites and the new ones added. I know that both at our indoor and outdoor stage this year, we've added kind of a modern Japanese act. One's a kind of J-pop group that's gonna be on the outdoor stage and another one's a Japanese fusion dance group that's gonna be on the indoor stage. So I'm really excited to see this mix that fully ranges from the very, very traditional to these more modern types of Japanese groups. Also, one exciting thing we're doing new is we have a new partnership with the Cupertino Historical Society and the Historical Museum is located right inside the Quinlan Center. We're really excited to be working with the Historical Society on some really fun interactive and hands-on exhibits that will feature our sister city. What should attendees look forward to at this year's festival? This year's featured artist is a huge crowd favorite. San Jose Tycho, who's nearing their 50th anniversary. So come to see them. And we're also going to introduce to the public Toyokawa's mascot, Inarin. He's this cute half fox, half Inari sushi character. And we're going to have a photo op area where people can take a photo with him. And we'll be giving away some temporary tattoos of Inarin uh, to everyone who will fill out a really quick festival survey for us. We're really looking forward to seeing so many people we haven't seen for the last two years. Please connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Evite, and YouTube. We really hope to see you at the festival. Thank you, Elisa, for uh, joining us at the Nichibe Cafe. For more information on this year's Cupertino Cherry Blossom Festival, please visit www.cupertinocbf.org. Thank you. Thank you.